So I just want to give a little introduction about the human experience and the gods we worship. Oh. <laughs> it's interesting to think about. I think we start with God as a parent because we provide what we need. <laughs> People ask me, what was your, what's the best age? What's the best time in life? And I say, something around eight to nine. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Nice. How old are the kids now? Eight. Eight. Yeah. <laughs> 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 eight and twelve. Eight. Yeah. Very good. Cool. So they're laughing, you know? Yes, yes. Mother asked the other mother to go on top of the roof of Namaste, <clears throat> which is just building. Oh. So she went on top. The yoga building. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Very flattering. So, we worship the God who is our father, our mother, who provides what we need. We have elaborate sacrifices and worship we do, right? And then after a while, we think of God as just in terms of duty, mm. right? And we're so caught up with survival that we think about the only thing important in life is work. And so we think of God in terms of work, what we have to do, what we're supposed to do. Imagine, you know, like when you can barely, when, when you can barely survive, when you pray to God to provide you what you need to survive. And then when you're able to survive, and you, then you want to create, yeah. you want to manifest your desires in the world. And so you think of the God as the God of work. And you think the purpose of life is working. And work is important but it's only part of the puzzle of life. It's not the soul, it's not the essence. It's like a, you know, like a house. A house is the place you live. What's the point of the house if no one you love lives there and doesn't become a home? Mm -hmm. It's a place for you to have shelter or peace or whatever it may be. But something that's very beautiful about Krishna is that he's not the god of duties. He's not even who we're praying for, providing us with everything. Once, What do you do once you are able to maintain yourself, you're able to work, you're able to do everything, and you're going to still worship the person who is just going to tell you what to do, and you have to do job and duties, and that's life. Mm -hmm. It's important, right? It's important. You have to do it. But what about once you're able to do that very nicely? Once you already completed that need? Plenty of what you need to survive, and plenty of food, plenty of shelter, plenty of purpose, plenty of mate development to the world. You've created all your structures, and then what do you do? And society is going through this now, right? Society is going to get to the point where we have, we know how to make food, we know how to take survive, we know how to take care of ourselves. We're learning how to not kill each other all the time, hopefully. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, but then eventually what happens when life isn't just about work? You imagine, if you look about a hundred years ago, it was common that kids would work, sometimes 12 hours a day. <coughs> People say, oh, you know, it's like, it's not fair. Men have get to be career oriented. That's a modern part of the life. Back in 150 years ago, it's like in a lot of areas of the world, you work to survive, everyone. <laughs> Everyone, you work to survive. Everybody, from childhood, you work to survive. And then the culture becomes more successful. Then you work to create. Now we're in a work to create culture, capitalism. Create products and sell products and consume products. And we get in this consumption cycle and creation cycle. Creativity is better than just consumption, but because it's a creativity cycle, you have to have consumers to keep the engine running. And so we're in this cycle. But what happens when we've created all the stuff we want and then stuff starts just being ex extraneous, extra? You end up with so much stuff and you just want to get rid of it <clears throat> at a certain point. We were talking about this the other day, right? When your room fills up with stuff, you think, what to do with it? We bought our ashram in New York and it was a quick closing. It was already said, quick, quick, quick. And so it was still full of stuff. 
with a big barn falling apart and full of the roof of stuff. It took months and months and months and months to clean it out and everything else in the property. It's just stuff. And then we're in this cycle of creating stuff and using stuff and where to get where to put the stuff once we're done with it. That's what we're doing in the ashram now. Where to put the stuff that the other people left there. Where to put our old phones, our old computers. And we're worshiping the God of work. And we think our life is, we are, if we are not working, then we are not good. I'm not I'm not helping, I'm not providing, because we've been in that cycle for thousands of years. We have to provide stuff. We have to make stuff, we have to survive, we have to create, we have to build. What do you do when all the buildings are built? Okay, we have to repair the buildings. Okay, what do you do when the machines can do that? What is life about beyond? I'm not saying those things aren't good. But there's maybe more to life than just building stuff and maintaining stuff and creating stuff and enjoying stuff and surviving. <coughs> So therefore, we should understand Krishna is something beyond all of these ideas of God in reference to the human condition. We think of God in reference to the human condition. God is providing rain. God is giving us obligations and duties. But real God is beyond this condition, in his own existence, his own experience. It's going for your job. <laughs> so, it's very interesting, you know, you think about Radha Krishna, what are they doing? Krishna doesn't have a job. You think like, because we think of God as what? Like, you think, you know, there's different ideas, and those are also, they have, like we would say from a Hindu point of view, all these possibilities exist. It's just a question of how do you want to experience and relate with something divine. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to be? And imagine you have choice. You have free will. And all these possibilities exist. And Vrinda and <laughs> Alankar are thinking, I know where I'm going. <laughs> right? So Vrindavan is that place where Sri Krishna is performing his pastimes free of all those concerns of all these different things. All the other levels of the Godhead are performing the functions, creation, maintenance, destruction. It's all going on. And all the other demigods are performing all the functions, air, night, wind, maintaining everything, keeping everything in order, the balance of life, the duality of life. Everything is going on. Right? But Krishna, so everything is going on so that Krishna can be doing what? So there's a story, once Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I think I said this the other day, very sweet. What is God doing now? What is God doing now? There's a story of, well, I'll give a quick story before the what is God doing now. But there's a story of a king who asked this question to his ministers. What is God? Who is God? What is he doing now? Where is God? Where is God? What is he doing? His chief minister, he asked, and his chief minister, I don't, know, I don't know the answer, difficult. And the king said, why are you my minister, useless? You can't answer me in three days' time. Something might happen. <laughs> you might get fired from your job in a fire. <laughs> <laughs> so he went back home, and he was disturbed, and he was stressed, and was thinking about it, he was studying all the scriptures, but he couldn't come to an answer. And his little boy, six-year-old boy, he had <coughs> higher intuition. He didn't have book knowledge. In his past life, he had realized knowledge. The book said, Father, why are you so upset? Why are you so disturbed? I'll tell you the answer. I'll tell the king. He asked, what is your problem? The king the minister told him. And so the boy said, I'll tell you the answer. And he said, okay, tell me. He said, actually, I'll tell the king. Because then the king will understand how great you are. Because you'll see that even your son knows the answer. <laughs> so they went. And the boy was dressed up very nicely like a pundit. Imagine very beautiful like Madan. Dressed up. Tilak, Chandan, Mala, Turban. 
Rudrakshas. Bharat. <laughs> very nicely dressed up. Baka Brahmin, Pandit. Very sweet, very cute, big cheeks, smiling. And the king said, okay, today the minister has brought his son. So then the king said, okay, do you have the answer? Where is God? What is he doing now? And the father was very confident. And he said, yes, dear king, this is actually a very simple answer. So I brought my son to the scribe. Okay. The king was now amused, entertained. And so <clears throat> he said, okay, tell me the answer. So the boy said, first, I am sitting here and you are way up there. The king is way up there and I'm down here. This is not the etiquette. If you're asking your, your teacher, you should not be up there. So the boy said, oh king, you should sit down here and I'll sit on your throne up there. And that's why the boy wanted to go. Because <laughs> he knew if he asked his father to say that, what would the king do? So the boy said, I have to ask the question and I have to give the answer. So the king, because it was a little boy, he's thinking, okay, let's play the game. So the king came down off his throne and sat, and the boy climbed up. In India, you have big stairs. The king so the boy is climbing up the stairs and looking down 15 feet below at the king and his father looking up, thinking his father's sweating now, you know? Because <laughs> the boy wouldn't tell his father, the father is sweating. The king is saying, Are you okay? He said, I have a little fever. <laughs> so then, then the king said, so? And he said, bring me a large pot. How big? The biggest. And so they brought a pot that was like, like in Navadweep, we cook for 15,000 people. And so the pot is like 15 by 15, 20 by 20, something more, 30 by 30, big pot. He said, okay, they brought it in, big, strong cooks and workers. They put the pot there and I said, fill it up with milk. And so everyone started bringing milk and he said, full cream. Then they didn't have non-fat. <laughs> so just milk is milk. Nowadays, milk is skim milk, 2%, 1%, 3%, no. 100% milk. I said, no soy milk. <laughs> so they brought the milk, and then the boy said, Oh, king, tell me, where is the ghee? Where's the ghee? Is there ghee in this milk? And the king said, yes, there is ghee. He said, I don't see it. I don't see the ghee. Do you see it? <laughs> Basanta sees it. <laughs> Lita sees it. A lot of ghee is there, right? Is there a lot of ghee? Lalita, you see? Everyone sees it, okay. Everyone sees the ghee. No problem. The king said, I don't see it, but the boy said, but how do you know it's there? But I know it's there, I've experienced it, I know the process. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> oh, he's going to the line. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> okay, so the boy said, the ghee is everywhere in the milk. It's actually in the human body also, if you say, where is your life force? It's throughout the whole body. It's said in the Gita chapter 2, I think, 18, that the spirit resides within the whole body. It's the field of awareness, and the awareness is permeating that body and then the surroundings also. You know where your soul is right now? Where's your spirit right now, your consciousness, wherever you're looking? Whatever is your experience, you're smelling, you're hearing, your consciousness is going out and collecting it and coming back inside and moving around in life areas. And you can become sick if consciousness goes too low or it comes too high and you're always stressed and tense. And so yoga teaches you to be present in the heart and to be peaceful, situated, and then engage your energy as needed. Sometimes in your arms, sometimes in your legs, how you see the power of the soul. Sometimes a mother or a kid may be under a car and something may be happening. Power, the soul, and the adrenaline, everything, she can lift up a car and save her baby. Right? So you can 
Move your energy like that. So the boy said, the ghee is everywhere in the milk. God is everywhere. That means, he said, his energy is everywhere. Presence is everywhere. He said, to see it, you need a process. There's a process to see the ghee. And it's time. So you have to boil the milk. People who are impatient can't find God. You can, you can experience and you can understand intellectually, but you have to be patient to follow a process like a scientist to get the results. You have to boil the milk, you have to let it cool a certain amount, you have to make yogurt, you have to churn it, you have to make butter, and you have to process it, cook it, and you get ghee. Right? So that's a process. So the boy said like that. And he said, this is where God is. The king said, very intelligent, very good. What is he doing? He answered one question, what is he doing? And the boy chuckled and laughed. He said, he's doing this. You were up top, now you're down here, and I'm up top. And I'll come back down, and after that, someone else will go up top. And this is called life. We're up and we're down, and we're riding the roller coaster of samsara experience. So this is what going on, this is what God is doing, this is where he is. This is one understanding. People like this philosophy, philosophical stories. So now there's a different story about what is God and where is he and what is he doing. Mahaprabhu, mm -hmm. Sri Chaitanya, was present in near Varanasi, in this area, traveling. And actually, Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Rupa Goswami was visiting. He was coming through that area. And before he met Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu was meeting with a great devotee called Raghupati. And Mahaprabhu asked Raghupati, Who is God? And where is God? And Raghupati said a very beautiful verse. He said, Those who are afraid of suffering and material existence, they worship the Vedas, the Upanishads, those who are seeking knowledge worship God like this, those who are worshiping in this way worship like this, those who desire these material benefits worship like this, those who are absorbed in duties and work worship like this. He said, as far as I'm concerned, I worship Nanda Baba, the father of Krishna, because that absolute truth has taken the form of this little boy who's rolling in the dust <laughs> and covering his body in the dust of Vrindavan. He said, I don't worship Vedas or Upanishads or this or that. I worship the Father, Nanda Baba, the Father of Krishna. Gurudev once asked, I was in school with Gurudev, no, maybe 11 or something like that, and Gurudev asked a question. He said, who is first, Krishna or his Father? God or his Father? Christ or Mother Mary? Who comes first? And Gurudev said, they're all eternal. Love is eternal. God is eternal, his family is eternal. Because mm. there's a verse, Ishwara Parama, Krishna, Anadi Adi Govinda, the first of all beginning, the creator of all creators, cause of all causes, beginning without beginning. That is Krishna. But then, who is Brajendra Nandana? So who is first, Krishna or his father? And Gurudev said, Nanda Baba. According to Rasa, according to relationship, Krishna is son of Nanda Baba. Because that's the reality he wants to live in. That's the reality he wants to be in. And that's eternal. Someone once asked, who is God, Vishnu or Krishna? He said, who are you asking? If you ask the Brajabhasis, they say Vishnu. Krishna's not God. They worship Vishnu. They worship Shiva. <laughs> Krishna also goes. Radharani also goes. Why? Because for them, Love and sweetness and beauty and play is more important than worship, to be God. To be God is not as important as to play with those you love. The God and the Goddess, they're playing, but they don't think about that. And so even their energy, not that energy, their energy covers over their knowledge of their own position. And so our Gurudev would teach us that, he said, many teachers have come and told you that Krishna is God, but I am coming to teach you that he is not. Mm -hmm. I am coming to teach you to forget this. And he said, this knowledge is important, but you, you, it will be a wall. And he said, you need this knowledge. 
It's important to understand everything. Understand Vedanta. And by the time you're old, you might understand once all your teeth are gone. <laughs> Learn. But if you don't cross over it, you'll never re relish pure love and sweetness. This is higher. So then Mahaprabhu was very happy and he said, please tell me more. To Raghupati. He told this first verse. Oh, I'm worshipping that father of Krishna and Krishna is rolling in the dust and playing with the cows. So he said, tell me more. And he said, very interesting verse. He said, who will believe me? This is what Raghupati said. He said, who will believe me when I tell them that Krishna is God and he's running and searching through the forests and the groves and the pathways of Vrindavan looking for his beloveds? Who will believe me? <laughs> he said like that. Mahaprabhu became intoxicated with this mood of bliss. So this is the problem is that people are filled with so much pride and so much doubt and so much confusion and the idea of what it should be like in reference to us and our condition. But what do you do once everything is already done? Then you want to experience love, you want to play, you want to sing. You know, imagine you have the best job in the world, you make the most money possible. And when you come home, believe me, you want to forget about it. Because it's duty and it's stress and it's responsibility. And I know because the friends you make who are like have some wealth, oh, they just want to hang out, especially with people who don't think of them in terms of their money, right? Yeah. Right? You can just be friends with. It's nice just to have friends. So imagine you're God and everybody all day long is calling you. <laughs> so there's the movie, right? Bruce Almighty. <laughs> he gets to be God. You seen it? Yes. He gets to be God. And he thinks, it's going to be great. I get to be God. And he's like, inbox. <laughs> One million and counting. And every moment it's going up. So imagine you're God and like everybody's always asking you for stuff. And blaming you for all their problems or everything bad that happens. And you're constantly having to do that. So God is very intelligent. He's omnipotent and omniscient. And he creates, yes. This is how you do it. Somebody wants the post? Yes, take it. <laughs> Indra, God of thunder. So many different gods. There's one sweet story that all the gods are competing. Indra, god of thunder, Vayu, god of the wind, Agni, god of fire, and so many other, they were competing. Who is the best? Who is the strongest? Who is the source? That's why in the Rig Veda, in the Rig Veda, there's a statement. We're going to get to Ravana. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get there. Some premise is good. Rig Veda says, whence have they all come? The gods are wondering. All the demigods are thinking, where do we come from? <laughs> so, why? Because we're only thinking, we're thinking up, and that what is up is also thinking down. But what is up is also thinking up. That is God. Krishna is beyond this earth and situation, but he's also very merciful, he comes, no problem. But that supreme being is in transcendental bliss. That's what Krishna says in the Gita. Krishna says, everything rests upon me. Everything in this world is dependent on God. Everything in this world, everything is strung upon, pearls strung upon a thread. That is God. Mm -hmm. He says, invisible thread, like a necklace. Mm -hmm. You have a necklace of pearls, and you think, it's just being held together by the pearls? No, there's a thread, but it's invisible. That is mm -hmm. God. Yes? But, Krishna says, and yet, I am existing in my own blissful abode. I am there. And I also, you can come and be with me when you're ready to give up work. When you're ready to retire from material life. When you're ready to retire from material life, you can come and be with me. But in the meantime, you should do your seva, do your dharma, take care of everybody, do your best, follow your dharma. It's very important. Don't neglect. We are life affirming, not life denying. We are life embracing, not life avoiding. We are life affirming, not life denying. Life embracing, not neglecting. But yet, Krishna says, Ultimately, there's a secret, you know, there's a secret, like a very fine print, but actually it's very fine because it's very beautifully written. <laughs> it's 
small but very beautifully written. And Krishna says, actually, you can get out of karma very easily. You can get out of debt very easily. You think, I'm in debt and I have to do this and do this. I used to think like this, you know. Oh, if we're not working, then we're useless. Mm -hmm. Our meaning is defined by our achievements and our status and our significance. And you think, oh, the guru are, they're just sitting and chanting. <laughs> but actually, there's a secret. Krishna says, for those who want to retire from material life and enter spiritual bliss and joy and pastimes, then you can do that. If you want, then if you want to come to me, then I've made an arrangement that you just give up everything else and come to me. And no longer any debt. And you can just live in the temple, practice bhakti, and then be with Radha and Krishna. Very sweet, very beautiful. So, with that being said, <laughs> we can talk about Radharani. <laughs> One day. <laughs> what is God doing now, right? Gurudev would ask this question. So, one day, Radharani was present in Vilaska. Vilas means her sweet pastimes and her that grove. And this is near her home, Varshana, which is a very beautiful Karmilai. Right, a very beautiful mountain top, a very beautiful hill. At the top of the hill, there's a beautiful palace called Sri Mandir, Radharani's palace, her father's palace, Bushavanu. And then from there in the morning, she goes to Vilaskar, which is where she performs pastimes with her friends. And it's a little bit away from the main palace because one thing about to understand Radha Krishna, there's also many levels, right? We think God and the goddess, and there's different levels where they're in wedded relationship and where they're in moods of opulence. But the highest level that we approach Radha Krishna is pure sweetness. They're not married because they're eight, nine year olds. <laughs> right? It's hard to understand, right? Oh, are they married? Are they married or not? They're kids. <laughs> That's one of their experiences. They want to experience life that. Most sweet, most innocent, most pure. Why not limit? You want to limit the infinite? People want to limit the infinite. People say, are they married? Why marry seven, eight-year-olds? They're very young, very innocent. Krishna did the rasa dance when he was seven, eight, eight and a half, most. Lifted Giriraj when he was seven. Krishna lifted Giriraj. But we think, oh, Krishna and the gopis and this and that, they're playing. They're kids. They're enjoying blissful pastimes. Sweet, innocent, pure love. This is pure love. Love manifests in many ways, but it's described in the charge to love is pure. Real pure love, that is, like love by nature is pure. Gurudev said it's about bhakti. Bhakti is bhakti. Everything else is mixture. But what is bhakti is bhakti, what is love is love. He said that's like the sun, effulgent, pure. So Radharani was in Vilaskar. And Krishna came. And now the gopis were dressing Radha Krishna, and decorating and giving them makeup, like ornaments. Mm. And they had two separate, like, flower bowers. Radharani's kunj and Krishna's kunj. So Krishna was sitting and... They had this idea that we're going to dress Radharani, and we're going to dress Krishna, and see whose Sringar is better. <laughs> Sringar means their outfit. And we think, who is dressing Krishna? Who is dressing Krishna? Cowherd boys? <laughs> Cowherd? No. So some gopis are dressing Krishna, and some dress dressing Shmati Radhika. What side do you do? Question. <laughs> no problem. Sometimes both. No. <laughs> Good. Okay. Anyhow, no problem. Shama Kanti, yes. Yeah. And Shamala. 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 Oh, it's okay. They do both. No, they take turns. But today they were doing separately because it was going to be like a match. Who can do better 
dress outfit, better decoration, better turban. We have this all the time in our New York ashram. <laughs> and you, you can see sometimes, you know, it depends on the person who's dressing. Sometimes everyone's like, wow, look at Krishna. Yeah. And sometimes everyone's like, look at Sri Radha, how beautiful. And our Krishna is always going. <laughs> And Radhika's yes. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but no problem. <laughs> so Radharani was dressed, Krishna, very beautifully, flowers. Radharani that wears very fine flowers. Dewy, Mali, Jasmine, very thin, very graceful, not heavy. Brita doesn't like heavy garlands for Radharani. Very gentle, very thin. Krishna, a little more heavy, no problem, but Radharani, very thin, graceful garlands. You don't want it to be like a burden, no? Sometimes people worship the Guru and there's one garland, another garland, another garland. It's like a garland mountain. You know? <laughs> but then it's like, with Gurudev, it was like that, you know? One person's seva was just taking off the garlands. Your service was taking it off and taking it off and taking it off, and then everybody gets a garland. So, they open the Flowers, and Radharani is on this side, Krishna is on this side, but wall of flowers in between. Mm. And it was taking sometimes, you know, half, some time, 20, 30 minutes, and then whew, same time, they get to look and see. Mm. Very sweet, huh? Mm. And so for a moment, everyone was just appreciating, very beautiful, very beautiful. Indrani Lamani Mandula Varna, Krishna is like shining like a blue sapphire said that Krishna is so beautiful, but when he is with Shumati Radhika, his beauty is unsurpassed. Right? God is always beautiful. It said if you were to see Lord Ram, <coughs> you would lose your heart, you lose your mind and everything, and you just think Ram, 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 Ram. You see Lord Narayan, like Dhruva. You lose your heart, you lose your mind, you lose everything. You're just mm. thinking, Imagine you're the most beautiful thing. Like the gopis see Krishna and they see his lotus feet and they become completely absorbed and they cannot see anything else. Mm -hmm. Or they see his beautiful smiling face and years could pass and they cannot stop looking at the beauty of Sri Krishna. So such is the beauty of Krishna. And when Krishna is, the nature of love is that you want to, when you want to please the beloved, your beauty increases. Because your beauty is part of how you're pleasing your beloved. So you imagine God with all potency, omnipotent God, is thinking, how can I be the most beautiful in this moment to please my beloved? Right? Because that's the nature of love. Love isn't about pleasing by doing something. Love is about being who you are and experiencing sweetness. What do you do when work is done? Right? That's our message. It's like it's okay just to be with those you love and be happy and it's okay. People sometimes feel so guilty about taking a break. <laughs> like, oh, I'm taking a break. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I'm learning that here. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Relax. Yeah. Just be. 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 Yeah. So you imagine the beauty of Krishna. <laughs> imagine, you cannot imagine the beauty of Krishna. It said when the soul finally achieves perfection, if it's, if it's desiring that path, if you're desiring that path, really, because that's who it's for. Krishna is like, we provide, everything is available. There's no burden, there's no shame, there's no guilt. Mm -hmm. Veda gives everything. You want to enjoy this world, take this book for how to enjoy the best way possible. No problem, no guilt. Spiritual life has gone wrong because we're basing everything on guilt, on shaming. Judgment. Yeah. You're not good enough because this. And most of the time, those people are the ones who are doing that. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Not to get into that topic. But Krishna, you, you can just, <coughs> for a moment, try to think that if God has all power and he wants to be beautiful for his beloved, mm -hmm. how beautiful would he be? Most. Oof. Manjari's like... <laughs> <laughs> Manjari's like... <laughs> if 
Bhakti, Lali, everybody. You imagine how beautiful Prema, how beautiful would be Krishna. You cannot imagine. You cannot imagine. Vasi, you can imagine? Gopi? Ramadadi? Mohini? <laughs> Very beautiful. How beautiful. We were talking about this yesterday. That we should not think love manifested as Radha Krishna. We should think Radha Krishna are love. Mm -hmm. Love comes from them. They are the source of love. They are the embodiment of love. That is Sri Radha. She is love personified. Mm -hmm. And Krishna is the experiencer of love personified. And that is their pastime. They are that complete existence. Fused together divine love, divine experience, divine bliss divine awareness in that pastime and so everyone is looking at Krishna why? Radharani is looking at Krishna how can you not look at Krishna right? and he's decorated like this how can you not imagine I say when the soul sees Krishna in Braj first you'll be born into Braj in that spiritual form and you'll hear the sound of Krishna's flute and pass senseless fall senseless Krishna will come closer and you'll smell the fragrance of Krishna. That new sense. Then after a long time, come awake again. And then Krishna will come closer and whisper in your ear. Wake up, Krishna, wake up. And Krishna will touch your hand. So you cannot imagine the beauty. You cannot imagine the sweetness. You cannot imagine the joy. It said God is in our heart. He's the heart of our heart, the soul of our soul, the self of our self. Everything you do is, that's why I was telling you, we were walking the other day. I said, yes, people tell you being selfless is good. You should be selfless. And we say, yes, but selfish is better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. said like that. Detachment is good, but attachment is better. Mm -hmm. What are you attached to? Attached to something greater, higher. Just attachment and you'll be attracted to something lower still. It's negative. It's repulsion. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. But then I want this. I want this. I want this. So attach yourself to something higher. Right? Peace is good. This is best. So that, that's my new mantra. Selfless is good. Selfish is better. Peace is great, but bliss is best. Okay? That's my mantra. Four lines. Selfless is good. Selfish is better. Peace is great. But this is best. <laughs> no problem. So everyone is seeing Krishna and absorbing this beauty. And it takes like a while to just, you know, shake it off. <laughs> Especially because Krishna is trying to please Sri Radha in that moment, right? And he's allowing himself to be decorated and Srimati Radhika is seeing Krishna. And Krishna is also very happy now because he's very charming. His name is dear, his quality is dear Lalita. Very charming, very beautiful, capable to control his lovers with her lovers. So everyone's appreciating and speaking about his beauty. And then after, you know, 30 seconds, because also first means not best. So first everyone's looking at Krishna <laughs> and describing the beauty of Krishna. And then they ask Krishna and Sri Radha, how is her beauty? How does she look? Krishna's looking, smiling, and how is the beauty of Sri Radha? <coughs> you imagine, you know, what is more beautiful? Like the flower or the person smelling the flower? Right? So, like, it's said that Shumati Radhika is the principle of giving bliss to God. She is, represents, she, is, she is that personality of love. Her whole existence is only to please her beloved, Krishna. And all that is in the world, all that manifests itself, anything that is beautiful, is just a tiny ray of that original source of all beauty. How can you describe that? You cannot even imagine it. But we are all are thinking about the subject. We are all thinking about God, or Krishna. But she is that perfection of beauty and bliss to please the beloved Krishna. Mahabhava, Surupatam, Shiratha, Thakurani, Sarvaguna, all good qualities, all beauty, all grace, everything is there. You cannot imagine it. You just leave it at that, otherwise class will go too long. Otherwise, you can have hundreds of verses describing the beauty of Shumati Radhika. You cannot imagine. 
And so Krishna is thinking, where to, where to begin? Krishna is sitting there looking at Shirada and thinking, where to begin? How to describe the beauty of Shirada? And Krishna's a little bit overwhelmed, so he just thinks, oh, Shirada, you are as beautiful as you are beautiful like <laughs> you are beautiful like Chandra. Chandra is one name for her. Brinda, that was big trouble. Big trouble. Chandra is the name for the moon and also a name for the rival of Radharani. The chief rival. And Chandra is like her complete opposite. Chandra her mood is completely different from Radharani. I said in life, you know, generally when you have conflict with someone, it's because they're a complete opposite. Ah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Such a boy. <laughs> Always picking on me. <laughs> but this is very sweet, no problem, brother. But the idea is, oh, you know, Chandra is like, it's very soft, very feminine, very docile, very submissive. Always pleasing Krishna, never chat, never contrary. And Radharani is completely contrary. Radharani's mood is always opposite mood. You know, that's why in our line, our Guru Varga, if they, if they say they're going left, they go right. If they say they do one thing, they, because they're always contrary. People think, always speak the truth. Right? But the highest Vaishnav, they never speak the truth. They always speak the truth, they embody the truth, but they're tricky. Contrary mood. Why is Radharani's line? It's They'll say they won't, like Gurudev would ask for him, do this. Like, Never, I won't do it. But then he does it. But it's this contrary <laughs> mood. It's sweet. It's more spicy. But Chandravali is very soft, very beautiful, very graceful, very submissive, very like 1950s housewife. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Cleaning, sweeping, sewing. But this is not Radharani. <laughs> Radharani is like, oof. Yeah. So Krishna is thinking how to describe her beauty. And he says, you are beautiful like, like Chandra. And Radharani's face becomes like, and Krishna is thinking, uh oh. Mm. And it's just quiet. And all the, you know, you know when someone says something, when someone really puts their foot in their mouth. It's like everybody knows. <laughs> Everyone's been glorifying Krishna, and Krishna's so beautiful, and he's so sweet, and this and that. Everyone's been glorifying for 10 minutes, and then Krishna starts and puts <laughs> his foot in his mouth, and all the manjris and all the gopis. And then Radharan doesn't say anything. Lalita indicates to Krishna. Bus. <laughs> Finish. <laughs> Lalita Devi is uh, Radharani's best friend, and she's a little older, 27 days older. And she's like big sister, but best friend. And she's been more haughty. Haughty means like, I don't know more how. Contrary. More contrary. Haughty. More contrary. More masala. More Spanish. <laughs> More masala. More spice. More chili. Like chili chocolate. What's this one you have? Uh, chili chocolate? Mole. Mole. Lalita is mole. Puro mole. Chili or chocolate. So Lalita says, okay, Krishna, time to go. Okay, so Krishna then is like, oh. Sex is bad. <laughs> Krishna gets up and says, <laughs> walks out and that day then he goes to raise the cows right he gets back home it's like six seven in the morning and krishna's grazing the cows but the coward boys are like krishna what's wrong today you're not happy today some problems like, yes. <laughs> you know, like when you do something really wrong you still do your work you still do your job you still yeah. do your seva but the mood is gone <laughs> mood is oh. so but krishna's thinking what to do what to do what to do Radharani is very angry. Very angry. Radharani is saying, like, once Krishna is gone, and wait till I know, because, like, serving Vaishnavas, you know, like, something happens, no problem, no, nothing, like, nothing happened. But wait a few hours when they're alone and they'll talk with you. 
Oh. Oh. Santa Cruz Pina, right? Oh. So then you get to hear the truth, you know? How they feel, how they've been hurt, you know? So very painful. Sometimes it'll be said, you know, you say something, like it's said in work, people say, oh, sticks and stones, sticks and stones break my bones. The words will never hurt me. But from regular people, no problem, but from someone you really love, oh, very painful, very painful. So Krishna's thinking, what to do, what to do, what to do, what to do. And the goddess of learning, Sarasvati, she put those words in Krishna's mouth. Sometimes it's said like that. Sarasvati Devi, the goddess of speech. She wanted to create Leela for some sweetness. So then Krishna, he was praying, he did his chores that day. <laughs> did the cow grazing. But today, normally when he goes, normally when Krishna goes to graze the cows, he's just for playing. It's an excuse. He plays with his friends, he's just doing everything like that. Only play. But today he was just doing his business and thinking what to do, what to do, what to do. So when he, sometimes in the midday, Krishna gets a, it's called midday pastimes, from 11, 30, 10, 45 to 3, 30, it adjusts. So we have a period of the day like that. And normally Krishna will meet with Srimati Radhika at her kund, her, her pond, Radha kund. Normally they'll meet together and they'll play games, they'll sleep with each other, they'll have lunch together, they'll sing, they drink honey, very like the bees, you know, they drink honey, it's called like honey wine. Very blissful. But today, no midday pastimes. <laughs> right? Today, no this is morning pastimes, and then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> morning pastime, and I'm finished. <laughs> Krishna's not even asking about midday pastimes. <laughs> <laughs> but Krishna has someone on his team, a spy. Krishna has some gopis who are on his team, but actually they're double agents. And I really am not around his team, but this is something difficult in life, you know. Sometimes in life you have to do something for someone you love that may not like you. Right? Double agent. <laughs> so Krishna is asking some gopis for advice. How to break the sulky mood of Sri Radha. She's very disturbed, she's very angry. How to break her mood. And they come up with a plan. So now, Radharani, I said, actually, first what happened is Krishna met with his spy. And he said, so what happened after I left? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want to know, right? Yeah. <laughs> for, Krishna is saying, no, this is what Krishna wants to know. Krishna wants to know what happened after I left. That's the first question. And then the gopi becomes very grave and, he's, and she says, you know what? After you left, you know, because there's only a few mandaris who can really be with Radharani at that time. So she was only with a couple. And everyone else was like getting busy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, time to put this away. <laughs> Neck extra necklaces go here. <laughs> extra cloth goes here. <laughs> stuff away. A few mandras there. And then Shimadi Radhik was alone. And then the Gopi said, when we came back in, she was gone. Disappeared. Mm. And nobody knows. And for the last few hours, we've been searching. For the last few hours, we've been searching. And nobody knows. So I think what Krishna's thinking. So Krishna says, okay, well, how are we finding? He said, we've sent out search parties. He said, we've sent out search parties every direction. Every direction we've sent out search parties. But if someone's playing hide and seek and they really want to hide, and they have all in Vrindavan. And you know, all in Vrindavan, everyone is Radharani's friend, and that means everyone's Radharani's helper. And so when Radharani's really angry, you imagine. Search party. Radharani can hide. <laughs> Radharani hides in such a good way that nobody can find them. Okay. No problem. Intermission. Dance. I mean, you have intermission and like before they have a music in the middle, right? 
Okay, so then, so Krishna's like trying to say, okay, give me, you know, reports. I want every five minutes reports. Have we found, have we found. In the mid-time, we need to get a team of strategists. <laughs> Call the rest of the team. <laughs> search parties and then Krishna calls his uh, you know consultants <laughs> called Mon consultants that's the brand <laughs> Mon consultancy agency at the emergencies only <laughs> so they come up with different strategies and Krishna said oh we tried that one last week <laughs> <laughs> what about this one? Uh, I don't know. She won't buy it. In the meantime, Lalita and Vishaka are searching. Lalita is very intelligent. She knows how to find Shimati Radhika. So two things are arranged. On one side, they come up with a strategy. On the other side, they find Radharani. But how? Lalita Devi engages the services of Bayu. Bayu means the Pavan, the wind god. Mm -hmm. She's coming up. He says, you have to help now. <laughs> but you have to help in such a special way that you can't reveal the answer to everybody. Only some people we help our team. We'll go and find and find. She must be in some hidden cave. Because we looked everywhere else. She's hiding somewhere. And you can go and collect her fragrance <coughs> and bring it back to me. Okay? So this is going on. And Bayu David goes and searches. Goes inside this very beautiful, very dark, very mysterious, mossy. The grass, the ground is covered with soft moss. And the very beautiful footprints of Shimati Radhika are there. And then <clears throat> there's some light, but it's very thin. You know, it's very soft, like dark blue, very light. And Shimati Radhika is sitting, and she's weeping. Fire droplets mm. dropping and sizzling. Very pain, very deep sorrow. And then the wind god brings it back out, and then Lalita Devi goes inside back to Vibraki. In the meantime, Krishna strategists, <laughs> they've come up with a plan. <laughs> <laughs> they say, Krishna calls his team members, he calls Indra. Says, remember, I let you off. <laughs> you owe me one. <laughs> so he says, bring me 5%, light cloud cover, soft, gentle, rumbling thunder, and just before it's about to rain. Want the bluest of the blue rain clouds to come over the sky, but not in a threatening way, in a very delightful way, very beautiful way. You know, like the rain that's like, oh, it's going to rain. But it's very beautiful, and it's also like some sunlight. Actually, it's said, you know, when there's sun and some clouds and raindrops, this is called the demigod showering flowers on earth. And then when you see a rainbow, like that. God is showering flowers. So Krishna said, give that scene. Sun <laughs> in one area. <laughs> sun. Imagine 4K to start. She said, 4K. 8K. Give some sunlight over here. And get the cloud cover and beautiful clouds and just a few drops. Like a few drops. And then Krishna calls the king of the peacocks. Ooh. King of the peacocks. Not Krishna, actually, Brinda. Oops. 
Not this bit though. What's implication here? <laughs> Chief advisor. <laughs> Chief advisor. <laughs> Chief advisor. No, actually, they had to go to Vrinda with the proposition afterwards. They had the petition. Yeah. She wasn't their advisor, but they said, Oh, dear Vrinda, we have this petition. You should bring all the peacocks and all the cuckoos and all the parrots. They're all Krishna's party. Always flying here and there. Krishna's <laughs> party. <laughs> So they all came and it was they were very happy because they felt very important. <laughs> yes. Imagine them coming in lines. Many lines, like on Navadri Parikrama, sometimes you see 10,000 people, 15,000 people. So all the peacocks are coming in a line. <laughs> right? And all the parrots are flying. The peacocks are walking. The parrots like, the peacocks like to walk. They fly sometimes, but really they like to walk. It's a very majestic and very stately and graceful. And, ah, flying is like... That's for lesser birds. <laughs> the peasants. <laughs> fly when they're afraid and they're like, oh, you're, you know, sometimes you have to go over a river, but usually they like to walk. So the peacocks are walking and the parrots are flying. So you can imagine the like infantry coming in and then flying all the birds from all around and they all assemble around Krishna. So Krishna's sitting in the middle, surrounded by thousands and thousands, all directions. And so Krishna says, we're going to do a dance. Vrinda Devi accepted the proposal because she doesn't want Radharani to go home sad that night. She be finished. They said, we're going to do a beautiful dance and all the peacocks are there offering feathers. Some, you know, they're offering a feather. One feather to Krishna and Krishna is decorated as beautiful peacock. Full disguise. Full disguise, only eyes. <laughs> full disguise, only eyes left. Peacock in full, like full, uh, full bloom. Fully spreading his feathers, like beautiful peacock fan. And when we do this fan for Krishna, this is imitating the peacock. Mm -hmm. It's shaking like this. So Krishna says, "Okay, we're going to do a dance for Radharani, and the rest we'll see. <laughs> we'll try." So in the meantime, Lalita Devi is talking to Radharani and trying to convince her to... She says, I know Krishna is always like this. He's always doing something like this or another. And I agree, we should not forgive Krishna. We should <laughs> forget about Krishna. But maybe, you know, it's actually really nice outside right now. There's rain clouds, beautiful. And I can hear some... Music is starting. <laughs> Very beautiful, beautiful music. Like a dance music, but gentle, beautiful, graceful. Like the best symphony, the best composer. And she said, it's not any humans, it's birds. The birds are creating this beautiful symphony. You can imagine. Beautiful symphony. Why? Because they see that the very beautiful clouds have assembled in the sky. Golden drops of rain, just a few are coming down, no storm, just very gentle, very beautiful, gentle breeze, it's very cool. Come and let us see. And she said, oh, now because of the rain clouds coming, all the peacocks have come out. Why? Because when it's rainy, when the rain clouds come, all the peacocks assemble and begin to dance. Mm -hmm. what they do. They all come to dance. And Lady Devi, I saw that they're doing this such a beautiful, the peacocks are so happy that they're dancing in this beautiful like formations. Mm. So thousands of peacocks from all over Brunch mm. are in this beautiful meadow. They're all dancing. Mm. And you should come out of your cave and you can sit on the hill and watch. And Radharani is thinking, no, but she said, listen, this will, anyhow, you can forget about Krishna for a while. No problem. So Radharani agrees and Lita Devi is holding her hand, and very gently, gracefully walking. And then they come out and there's a cave there. This is called Murkuti, the peacock, where this cave was, where this past term <coughs> was performed. So there in Bashan, if you can go, very beautiful Murkuti. So Radharani comes and sits, and then all the other gopis come. All the gopis come and sit around Radharani. So they're very happy now, right? So 
Radharani and nursing Radharani, and Radharani is a little bit, a few hours have gone by, so she's surrounded by all the Sakis, all the Manjris, and Bella, and everyone is very happily sitting down. And then in the meantime, they're performing this. Krishna's trying his best. I <laughs> try. <laughs> you can imagine, like 10,000 peacocks are dancing together. Krishna's camouflage there with all of them. <laughs> Krishna's feathers don't go down, they just stay up. <laughs> He's in the middle dancing, but it's like Rasa Lila for peacocks. <laughs> Imagine, like one circle, another circle, another circle, all these different dance formations, and all the other kinds of birds are singing. All the different kinds of cuckoos, parrots, all the different, you know, there's different birds. You can do bass, <laughs> rumble, soft, you know. All the different kinds of birds, and Vrinda Devi is, you know, <laughs> and in this way they're all dancing, and it goes on, you know, like a beautiful performance goes on. 10 15 minutes, 20 minutes, different tempos, different songs, and then as it's coming to its crescendo, then they have this arrangement that all the peacocks come in a circle and they bow at Radharani's feet, one by one. In the dance, one by one, and by this time, Radharani has forgotten everything about all these. You know, when you want to forget sometimes, and you've already cried it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, a distraction, <laughs> and something beautiful. And so, one by one, by one by one, they come. Oh, so then quickly, but then one touches her feet, and that we continue. <laughs> It's just like bowing, you know, so you can't see, you only see the feathers. And she's thinking, what do you want? <laughs> you know, the feathers are completely covered, and so Krishna's face inside. <laughs> just his little eyes, and he's offering pranam and praying for forgiveness internally. You know, first prayer starts in the heart. And praying, he's praying, and praying, and praying. Radharani is thinking, who is this? Perhaps this is the, the chief. Please, she said, like I am happy with you, no problem. Don't be sad, I'm happy with you. She goes, look up, no problem. <laughs> I'm happy. And he's still down, no, 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 please. So finally you can imagine this moment, you know. Peacock feathers lift up. And Krishna's eyes. <laughs> and Radharani smiles. <laughs> and Krishna goes like this, <laughs> but his hands come out, you know. In Indian culture, you hold your ears to ask forgiveness. In Indian culture, you know. Vrindavan culture. So Krishna is just peacock, you know, and he finally, when she said, I'm happy, don't worry, you don't have to, okay, I'm very happy with you. He lifts up the feathers, and she sees his eyes, and she smiles. <laughs> Look how hard he tried. <laughs> and then Krishna's hands come out and sorry. <laughs> and no problem. <laughs> At that point, not too much talking. <laughs> no one <when> to exit. <laughs> <laughs> Krishna again offers pranam. Goes back, but Radha is a little happy. Then she goes home, has dinner, with her friends. She's happy. Why? Because um, Krishna did a, he did a good job. He tried really hard. <laughs> yeah. And so this is called Murkuti. And Krishna goes home and he's thinking, tonight Rasa dance? Why tonight Purnima? Can we watch the dance tonight? Mm, maybe. Who knows? Maybe. But Krishna will be there just in case. <laughs> said when Krishna goes home, imagine like it's before morning time, Leela, and then daytime, cow grazing, thinking what to do, what to do, what to do, and then searching, and Radharani's disappeared, and then, but now after this, imagine how happy Krishna is. Like, he feels like if, you, if you've done something wrong, and then you pacify it, and did some service, and then you're very happy, right? Very peaceful. And so you're thinking, oh, if we could just speak a little bit, a few words like that. So when Krishna gets home, 
Mother Yashoda, gives him his bath, and then they go, and every evening, Krishna goes and he watches some dramatic performance, some magicians, or some tales, some storyteller, uh, some beautiful activity, and then Krishna starts to yawn, oh, I'm very tired. Krishna watches it, like sometimes you're watching a movie, you know, and then you get tired, and you go, ah, I just go to sleep, you know? <laughs> so Krishna's yawning, and stretching, and it's like 8.39, now <laughs> and then Krishna will go and Nadesha tucks him in bed and sings lullaby. What does she sing? <laughs> Krishna is purring, sleeping. He wakes. You know, Krishna is, Krishna is doing meditation, mindfulness. <laughs> okay, it's at least 60 seconds. Krishna's counting his mind. One, two, eight, <laughs> 15. <laughs> 60. <laughs> so Krishna counts. Okay, she's gone. And Krishna gets up from the bed and he puts pillows. That's why there's many pillows, you know. People ask sometimes, why do why are there so many pillows on the bed? Mm -hmm. You see this, right? Boys don't understand usually, unless they're more like this. <laughs> Like more, like this. more like Krishna. <laughs> very tricky, very naughty. Sometimes you go to someone's house and their bed, there's like 15 pillows on the bed. What's it for? Oh, it's like decoration? Decoration? No, it's for, for putting under the blanket and making it look like you're sleeping. <laughs> right? So Krishna puts under the pillows there. Krishna has a window like this, but not like this. He has a big room, beautiful room, but he has a little like escape pod, escape window. And he goes down and hops down to the grass. And he's covering if it's full moon night, like tonight, then Krishna will cover with something white cloth. Mm -hmm. Like a nice white chatter. And if it's dark moon night, Sometimes if it's starry night, dark with stars. <laughs> and Krishna is like camouflage, like an invisibility cloak. <laughs> or sometimes they'll wear a cloak like, like the forest. You imagine and you look and you see. It's like the leaves are moving and there's sparkling emeralds and it's just and this way Krishna will disappear into the mist of the forest. And Krishna disappears. Very early, <laughs> Story time. Let's do one bhajan. Okay? But no, we have to do the bhajan at this point. This is the last of the bhajan. Sata Gopi Gopi. What time is it? Okay. 
I had three stories to tell, but we got through one. Mm. Three more days. No. Two more days. No problem. Well, there's many stories. Next year, no problem. Okay. Next mm. year. Tomorrow. Can't you just stay longer? Tomorrow. Oh. No problem. I try to negotiate. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Next year. No, no but like so many. So I need to hear the story. Okay. Job, 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 only if I get to bring presents for everybody. Okay! <laughs> <laughs> Any stories? Deal. As many, as many stories as many people do. Yeah, Christmas is good here because this is like the North Pole. <laughs> yeah, the Santa Claus neighbor, you know. Probably. The Santa Claus. The Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, that's true. The Santa Claus. You know Santa means saintly person. Saint. Okay. Sing the song before Sata Goti Goti. Baraja Vipine. And we'll read the translation a little bit so everyone can understand. 106. Very sweet song. 108? 106. In the forests of Braj, along the banks of the Jamuna, there are enchanting platforms beautifully decorated with flowers. Varieties of fruit trees and creepers give satisfaction to the eyes. On them, many birds sing sweetly. The cooling breeze from the Malaya hills, Malaya is where all the sandal comes from. So a cooling sandalwood breeze comes and blows gently, and a swarm of bumblebees wander about in search of honey. The full moon of the spring season continuously distributes its soothing rays out of love. At such a time, the supreme relisher of nectarian mellows, that flute player Sri Krishna, begins the rasa dance. In the midst of millions of the lovely cowherd damsels, Sri Hari blissfully dances with Sri Radha. Singing beautiful songs, the enchantress of Madhav captivates the minds of all living beings. All moving and non-moving beings are enchanted by the chaste Sri Radha, who has defeated the pride of Chandravali. <laughs> After churning Braja Kishore's heart, Radharani disappears from the Basanti Ras. Bhakti Vinod foresees trouble. In the absence of Radha, the Rasa dance has now stopped. Seems like today's story. And Krishna starts the Rasa dance, very nice. Baraja Vipine Jamuna Kule Mancha Mano Hara Shobita Fule
जय जय श्री राधे जय जय श्री राधे